the Council on Strategic Risks podcast network, where we discuss anticipating, analyzing, and addressing core systemic risks to security in the 21st century. I'm your host, Dr. Shatha Chakraborty. Iran and Saudi Arabia are geopolitical rivals that have been at the forefront of the global and security discourse for the last several years. For this episode, we will delve into the climate, nuclear, and security dynamics unfolding in the region. Today I am speaking with David Mickle and Christine Parthamore, two experts familiar with these countries and their nexus of issues. David Mickle is a senior research fellow with the Center for Climate and Security. He is also currently a research fellow at the United States Institute of Peace and a consultant with the Atlantic Council. Previously, he served as a research fellow and director of the Environmental Security Program at the Stimson Center, executive in residence at the Geneva Center for Security Policy, and senior manager at the Transboundary Water Management Department at the Stockholm International Water Institute. David has written widely on international climate negotiations, the water food energy nexus, and the emerging policy challenges posed by global environmental change. His work has appeared in the Journal of Hydrology, Water International, Applied Energy and Foreign Policy, among other outlets. And he has contributed to government policy analyses in the U.S. and abroad, including the U.S. intelligence community assessments of global water security, food security, and the rise of hydro diplomacy. Christine Parthamore is the CEO of the Council on Strategic Risks and an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins. In 2016, she was a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow in Tokyo, focused on international civil nuclear cooperation. She previously served as the Senior Advisor to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs in the Pentagon, an office that runs the Nuclear Weapons Council. Her work spanned from projects to destroy chemical weapons to biosecurity programs with partner countries to overseeing treaty compliance and research and development. She's worked with think tanks, spoken at the United Nations, has published widely, and has extensive experience in Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. Nuclear affairs in this region have dominated headlines in recent years. Christine, can you tell us a bit about the multiple nuclear trends that are unfolding in this region? Sure. So I'll start with Iran. They've had a civil nuclear program for energy purposes and for medicinal isotopes for decades now, though years ago it became clear that they were hedging toward nuclear weapons capabilities as well. The United States and many other countries were obviously very concerned about this. During the Obama administration, they then developed what was called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or colloquially known as the Iran Nuclear Agreement, to try to stop this. So that put in place the most intrusive inspections ever, really, for a civil nuclear program to try and make sure that the activities that were going on, the nuclear activities that were going on, were only for civilian purposes and couldn't be diverted from making nuclear weapons. Since that time, of course, the United States withdrew from, from that agreement. In addition to withdrawing from other climate and arms control treaties, Iran has taken activities that take them out of compliance with it in response. Um, Our European allies and friends are trying hard to keep the agreement together, trying to get Iran back into compliance and to try and set a path to make sure that the country does not uh, endeavor to go to hedge further toward having nuclear weapons capability over time. Very concerning situation. That agreement is on life support at best. So it's a big, big worry. Meanwhile, right across the water in Saudi Arabia, they have for a few years now been trying to move forward on having a civil nuclear energy program there as well. They currently don't have any nuclear reactors like Iran does, but they've been moving in that direction. They put out a call for proposals for companies from Russia and the United States and South Korea and others to bid on supplying them reactors. Um, Now, that hasn't moved forward very well. Um, So for disclosure, I've spent a lot of time there talking to people around the country about that potential nuclear energy program. Um, It seems to be currently kind of at a logjam. So with the United States, for the United States to export civil nuclear technology and materials, for the most part, we require what we call a 123 agreement, um, named after the Atomic Energy Act, Section 123. That requires that uh, a country receiving nuclear technology or materials from the United States signs up to be very responsible with how they go about that to, again, ensure that all of that, all of what we transfer over or spread knowledge about goes only towards civilian purposes and not toward creating 
nuclear weapons capabilities for another country. We don't currently have one of those agreements in place with Saudi Arabia. The Trump administration was negotiating one, but it got stuck on provisions around the additional protocol. The additional protocol is uh, an extra set of measures uh, with the International Atomic Energy Agency by which countries agree to even more intrusive inspections um, and measures to make sure that countries' nuclear programs are only for civilian purposes. Saudi Arabia has today refused to sign the additional protocol. Um, in the United States, both the administration and Congress now seem pretty insistent that Saudi Arabia sign on to those additional measures. We're going to enter into a 123 agreement together. This issue and um, the snag with the United States seems to have helped pause things and slow roll things in Saudi Arabia. They have moved forward on starting to build a research reactor, um, I believe housed at one of their universities. So that is moving forward. But I think that both countries are trying to get Saudi Arabia to agree to the additional protocol and potentially have a 123 agreement with the United States in place before they move forward on their large scale reactor program. Now they might not, they could just decide to go with a vendor such as Russia to provide nuclear reactors to start their program and leave the United States mostly out of the picture. So that, that program could take a lot of different futures. Um, right now it's nascent and more of an idea than an actual program on the on the ground like Iran's next door. So generally in the region, obviously these are just two countries that these are, are of significant concern for security and other region and other reasons. Many countries in the Middle East and North Africa have been looking at moving forward on civil nuclear programs as well. But these are two countries where a program already exists in one case and where there seems to be forward movement on the other. Thank you for that overview. So Let's turn our attention to an overlooked but pressing issue in the region, that is water and environmental security. We know that last year, nationwide flooding in Iran killed many and caused over $2 billion in damages. Prior to the floods, Iran was going through severe decades-long drought, which hit the country really hard. The head of Iran's meteorology service stated that the floods were due to climate change. We also know that Saudi Arabia is vulnerable to flooding and serious water stress. And climate forecasts posit that by mid-century, average warming rates will be higher in this region compared to the global average. So given all of that, David, we know you've studied water conditions in the region. Please tell us a little bit about it. What is your top concern and how could it affect geopolitical stability? Sure. Uh, let me start with Iran. The Islamic Republic faces growing water crisis. Progressively mounting demands and persistent management deficiencies are imposing unsustainable pressures on the country's freshwater resources. And these strains will be further exacerbated by ongoing climate change that will diminish the quantities, degrade the quality of water resources available, and disrupt the seasonal timing and the geographical distribution of available water supplies uh, around the region. And these increasing stresses risk impairing Iran's economic development, uh, uh, compromising their food security, undermining public health, uh, and they could potentially uh, upset national and regional stability uh, with both domestic and regional security consequences. Just to give a sense of Iran's current water position, uh, the Islamic Republic uh, now is using or with annually withdrawing about two-thirds of its annually available renewable water resources. Now, as a rule of thumb, because water availability and water demands vary throughout the year, according to growing seasons and uh, municipal and industrial demands, hydrologists normally consider that when a country or a community is using more than 40% of its available water resources, it is suffering from water stress. And Iran is now using two-thirds of its water resources. For more than half of the country, the average monthly use uh, exceeds the, uh, the monthly available ability. Most of Iran's rivers are uh, considered hydrologically closed, which means that under current usage practices and management practices, all of the available water in those rivers is already allocated to various human uses, like agricultural irrigation, drinking water demand, or else to supporting uh, vital ecosystems uh, in those rivers, meaning that they have little to no spare capacity left over to accommodate uh, new users or growing demands. So to take a river uh, like the, the Ziyandarud, for example, in, in central Iran, in the city of Isfahan, there's a, a famed 16th century bridge called the Alaverdi Bridge, 
33 arches spanning the river, tourist attraction, a source of pride to the, to the city. And for much of the year, the river under those arches is dry and you can walk straight across uh, the riverbed. Likewise, uh, groundwater, underground uh, aquifers, uh, they supply about 60% of Iran's water withdrawals, though the heavy use of those uh, aquifers is rapidly depleting them so that water tables uh, around the country are falling. In 12 of Iran's 31 provinces are projected to actually exhaust their underground aquifers in, uh, by 2050. And climate change is going to make these supply issues uh, worse in the future. Uh, on one projection, because of the changing rainfall patterns, diminishing rainfall, and the greater uh, evapotranspiration because of higher temperatures, those factors could reduce the replenishment and renewal of Iran's uh, water sources uh, by a quarter, by 22% uh, by mid-century, by 2050. So the stresses on supply are quite considerable, and they're, they're unfortunately uh, aggravated by management deficiencies as well, that Iran uh, subsidizes uh, water use by farmers, agriculture, takes up 90% or more of Iran's water use, and uh, farmers do not pay charges for water use reflecting the actual cost of supplying that water. Also, fuel and electricity uh, for pumping water are also heavily subsidized. So the Iranian agriculture uh, uses about two to three times as much irrigation water for various crops as the global average. The irrigation efficiencies are low. Water is wasted because there aren't economic incentives to, to conserve it. And to give just one uh, example of the, the, the impacts on farming practices, the climate of uh, Iran is, is quite diverse, east to west and north to south. And yet every single province in Iran, uh, regardless of its weather conditions and its farming conditions, every single province grows wheat to support local demand because of the subsidies that make that economically viable. And Iran not only subsidizes production, but they also, as a matter of national food security, uh, they subsidize consumer consumers uh, as well uh, to make sure that staples are available to the most vulnerable populations and food self-sufficiency, food security is actually enshrined in the 1979 uh, constitution. So uh, through this dual subsidy regime of supporting both agricultural production and agricultural consumption, the incentives of uh, the drive for agricultural water use uh, is encouraging mismanagement and, and, and wasteful use that is uh, heavily impacting resources. And to come to the uh, geopolitical or regional and national uh, stability and security implications, uh, because of the necessity of building uh, infrastructure to support these agricultural demands and, and also uh, rising demands in, in cities, to build uh, dams, to uh, create reservoirs for water storage, canals and transfers between river basins to direct water to where it is needed and where it's being used. And this raises political frictions, competition between different regions for water water use, competition between farmers and uh, demand in the cities, and competition between regions, between large-scale sugarcane farming, for example, in the southwest, and the needs of uh, smaller local farmers. So there are uh, rising tensions between, uh, between regions, between farming uh, communities and cities, and some of these, uh, these tensions have given way to uh, violent and even deadly uh, riots and, and confrontations. And that same uh, dynamic is repeated at the international scale, because Iran shares rivers with its neighbors, such as Afghanistan, Iraq, and their two competing demands are uh, driving those countries uh, to loggerheads, also sometimes with, uh, with violent uh, implications. David, thank you for so thoroughly describing the water conditions in the region and across all the different sectors. Let's now turn our attention to the intersection of environmental challenges and nuclear energy. Both of you would have a position on this. Let's start with Christine. Both Iran and Saudi Arabia rely on desalination technology to supplement their water supply. Saudi Arabia, we know, has advanced plans to utilize nuclear energy to power the energy intensive water conversion process. So Christine, what should we think about these developments? Well, I think everything that David just said <laughs> is what we should be thinking about. People need water, right? And there are significant water challenges in these areas that, um, you know, when we're talking about nuclear energy and what that means for uh, a lot of different security concerns and things in this region, and we don't talk explicitly about the water side of things, which is part of why we're having this conversation today, right, is to bring these threads together. 
but you know, I know I've never been to Iran, but when you talk to anybody in Saudi Arabia, they're very, very clear that they don't have enough water uh, without desalination technology being part of the mix and that they're going to need more and more of it in the future, given everything that David was just talking about for the region. This is on the top of people's minds wherever you go. Nuclear energy isn't required, of course, for this, but it's a very energy intensive process. So it's hard to blame countries for eyeing things like nuclear reactors and coupling them with desal plants uh, as a way to potentially meet their water needs um, and generate the energy that's required to do that. I can't say that it's not not a concept that doesn't bring concerns. You always want to make sure no matter what the power from nuclear reactors is going to, they have to be safe. They need to be secure. The materials need to be handled properly. Um, and we need to make sure that these programs are not operated in a way that, and shaped in a way that could lead to pro proliferation concerns, which we'll talk about in a bit. But at the end of the day, people need water too. So can't blame these countries for looking at this option. So David, would you like to add to that sentiment? Sure. So Iran doesn't, to my knowledge, explicitly emphasize its nuclear power programs or ambitions as a source of energy for desalination. That being said, desal is incredibly energy intensive. And this is one reason why the some of the Gulf countries do talk about nuclear power as a source for that energy. Um, it's also one of the reasons why Gulf countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the Emirates, uh, that have substantial fossil fuel energy supplies uh, are also the major centers of desalination production because they have the energy resources to be able to afford and to power those uh, those plants. That being said, to my understanding is that the, the Bushir uh, nuclear facility in Iran actually was originally designed with a an associated desalination plant, but that fell through for various reasons of delays in the production and construction. In Iran does have substantial desalination ambitions to build maybe up to 50 plants along the southern coastline uh, and then to pump desalination water into the interior. The major difficulty, not only for Iran, but for uh, other countries around the Gulf to really uh, utilize desalination technologies to tackle their water challenges is that for most of these countries, and Iran being one, it's agriculture that is the, the major demand center for, for water supplies. Growing zones are in the interior of these countries, and in Iran, in the, in the central plateau, and not only uh, far inland uh, of both the Gulf and the, the Caspian Sea, but also often at much higher elevations, obviously, than the coastlines. So there are very, very large energy demands and costs associated not only with actually desalinating the water, but very, very critically, Costs and costs and challenges to delivering the water to the demand centers, to pumping it around the country, and for agricultural uses, this is a, a, an economic challenge because the value of the water, or uh, better to say, the value of the crops, the, the users won't recover their costs by selling those crops. The, the cost of uh, obtaining the water doesn't justify, and you know, can't be justified by growing those crops, and that's why desalination technologies are, are much more often used and much more important as sources of uh, municipal drinking water and uh, some industrial demands. And this is where uh, the Gulf countries typically uh, use uh, desalination technology. So you mentioned some of the issues around these regions, and you specifically mentioned the Bashir nuclear plant. So in December 2019, a magnitude 5.1 earthquake hit the southwestern part of Iran near this plant. So in addition to all the things you've just talked about, natural disasters are on the rise and continue to plague the region and they can intersect with these nuclear infrastructures that are in place. You've written about this extensively. Can you talk a little bit more about this and what the concerns are related to natural disaster and nuclear infrastructure? Um, well, so there are concerns not only with nuclear infrastructure, obviously, for the catastrophic uh, damages that could result if a seismic activity contributed to faults or destruction of a, of a nuclear facility, but there are also uh, concerns about earthquakes and water infrastructure and, uh, and dams. In uh, 1990, uh, there was an earthquake in Iran that damaged a dam in the, the Alborz Mountains in the north. The Sefidru Dam earthquakes can also not only induce you know, ruptures or cracks in the dam or 
plant in a nuclear facility. They can cause landslides or shifts in the surface, cause landslides to fall into the reservoirs held back by the dams. And this sudden shock of pressure in the reservoir, you know, imagine dumping millions of tons of rock and earth into a reservoir that causes uh, essentially a tsunami uh, on the reservoir surface. And that water pressure could uh, bust the, the dam, could burst the dam, in addition to cracks that might arise from the actual earthquake, the, the shaking of the seismic activity. So there's significant potential in Iran for earthquakes to cause uh, major disasters around water infrastructure. And interestingly, there's a, a flip side to this relationship, a potential disaster relationship between uh, dams and water infrastructure and seismic activity. And that is this possibility that the reservoirs themselves, that the weight of the water contained within the reservoir sitting on the Earth's crust, that the weight of the reservoir could itself induce seismic activity. And we've actually seen this phenomena arise in, uh, in China, for example, uh, a reservoir-induced earthquake. And studies indicate that there is, a, there is a correlation, there actually has been a relation between uh, seismic activity in the Karun 3 Dam in the southwest of Iran and uh, earthquakes uh, in, in that region. So there's a, to my mind, there's a closer, uh, uh, more active tie between earthquake activity and uh, water water infrastructure and dams. All that being said, however, the, the, the scale of the das disasters that are possible in seismic zones where there is nuclear infrastructure is, uh, is much larger and also has international and regional ramifications that would not necessarily be present in a, a domestic earthquake situation, so to speak. So we can envisage that if nuclear power were to become a greater source of energy supply and uh, there certainly is a demand for energy in the water sector for desalination. We could envisage scenarios in which nuclear facilities powering desalination uh, plants could pose risky scenarios and worrying scenarios for, for the region if uh, earthquakes were incorporated into that, that scenario building. And one could also imagine, uh, envisage the, the, the challenges, the issues that neighboring countries would see vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other if the country next door were projecting to build nuclear facilities to power desalination. And so what does this mean for the stability of the region in terms of its farmland, in terms of migration of people? How do these dynamics potentially play out in the next decade? And how is the governance around it? Well, we're already seeing, as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing uh, demonstrations, riots, tensions, uh, even international tensions around water management, uh, supply and distribution. There have been just recently, as, as uh, last year, both in the, in the center around Isfahan and also in the southwest, there have been violent demonstrations where... Uh, so just over even the, the past uh, couple of years, we've seen uh, violent demonstrations uh, in Iran in the, in the center, in the southwest, uh, clashes between farmers and police where farmers were protesting the construction of diversions or pumps that were diverting their water supplies to urban centers. Also clashes over water quality where the withdrawal of water from river sources for farming or, or, or agriculture or, or other reasons because it diminishes the amount of water in the river, it concentrates or increases the amount of pollutants in that source and causing public health uh, problems uh, and giving rise to protests where public clashed with government security services that uh, the provision of water as a public good is a measure of the performance legitimacy of the, of the government. So when public authorities, when the government can't supply uh, sanitation services, clean water, this is, can be a, a source of popular grievances, which together with other resentments about corruption or power distribution can power can fuel uh, popular demonstrations and we've seen this not only in uh, in Iran but also at the border with with Iraq where this very same uh, challenge this very same dynamic that I was mentioning uh, whereby the removal of water from rivers the diversion for agriculture etc because it reduces the amount of water available downriver concentrates uh, pollutants and because 
because uh, Iran and Iraq share parts of the Euphrates Tigris system, the water diversions in Iran were decreasing water availability in Iraq. And there were uh, very large and violent demonstrations uh, in Basra over public health issues, water supplies, not directly uh, blaming uh, Iran, but, but very critical uh, of public authorities and also of their relationship with Iran. So creating an amalgam uh, of grievances that are catalyzing uh, unrest. Um, and there are similar concentrations over water use around other borders uh, as well. In fact, there's often a, a center periphery and an ethnic component to water clashes in Iran between ethnic regions uh, around the edges like Arab populations in the southwest, Azeri populations in the northwest, or Balach populations uh, in the southeast that clash with the Persian center over power distribution and water demand. Uh, so Lake Urmia in the northwest uh, of Iran used to be the largest lake in the Middle East. Since the 1970s, it shrunk by 80 percent, largely due to uh, diversions and water withdrawals, uh, as well as climate conditions. And uh, Azeri nationalists accuse uh, Tehran and the Persian center of strangling the lake to throttle their, their nationalist aspirations. So Saudi Arabia and Iran are considered arch rivals. They're embroiled in a proxy war in Yemen, and both are trying to spread their influence throughout the Middle East. Both are dealing with similar daunting climate projections. Both are dealing with varying degrees of domestic socio-political change as well, and military confrontation between them. At the same time, there are serious concerns that both countries may be hedging towards nuclear weapon capabilities. The Iran nuclear deal has fallen apart. And on CBS's 60 Minutes, the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman stated that, without a doubt, if Iran developed a nuclear bomb, we will follow suit as soon as possible. Christine, this sounds very scary. Tell us more about it. Is the Middle Eastern arms race probable? Um, I don't want to get into probabilities, largely because I think we fool ourselves when we try to put numbers behind uh, the likelihood of different things happening. Um, but it's a huge concern. So don't want to overblow it. Both countries are, well, remind listeners, are signatories of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. That said, uh, there are concerns that that treaty might not survive too much longer, um, or at least will be weakened um, by the actions of a lot of different countries, including nuclear weapons states like our own, who have um, not met their obligations under the treaty to make progress toward disarmament. Uh, countries can also withdraw from the treaty at any time, like North Korea did as well. So that would be a concern. That would obviously be a huge marker. Marker in the sand that these countries, potentially across the region, that there's going to be um, much more arms racing type of activity. Uh, happening. Uh, but it's a huge concern. I don't like any nation's leaders, um, including our own, being bellicose about the prospect of uh, getting nuclear weapons and using them on other countries. Um, I think it's incredibly destructive uh, and really just sets off alarm bells even more than they would need to be. Now, these countries are always going to be, even if both Iran and Saudi Arabia continue to have fully civilian peaceful nuclear energy programs, they're still going to be suspicious about one another's intent over time, especially if enrichment and reprocessing capabilities that can help bring countries t closer toward nuclear weapons capability proliferate around the region beyond what they already are uh, with Iran, for example. So that's something to watch, um, but it's a big concern. I think that hedging will continue. I'd be willing to bet that that's part of uh, Saudi Arabia's interest in nuclear energy as well, is that hedge capability that they could potentially develop. Um, for the United States, uh, what this tells me is that we need to go back to having a much stronger role in international nuclear issues and relations. We historically were a world leader on this, of course, going back to Adams for Peace and other programs. Uh, we have a long history of bipartisan leadership in arms control and threat reduction and trying to increase the world's nuclear safety standards and in, in, uh, nuclear material security with issues, uh, initiatives like the Nuclear Security Summit process. Um, that ran for years, led in part by the United States at the, at the forefront of it. Um, the next administration, no matter which party it is, I think all of this, what you're hearing and seeing out of the Middle East is a reminder that we, that administration, no matter who it is, again, needs to come in with a robust plan for U.S. nuclear leadership as a key part of their national security strategies. If we don't have one, we're bound to potentially exacerbate some of the challenges that you see in this region. Um, or disregard them and let them go on in a way that leads to even more concerning behavior between countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia. 
So hopefully we'll take back that leadership mantle that we used to have. David, any thoughts to add to that? Yeah, that I would just add that uh, the Iran's water challenges and the search for solutions can also be a, a source, a possible avenue for uh, regional and international cooperation and was to a certain extent uh, had it, heading in that direction after the JCPOA that with the, the easing of uh, restrictions that made investment safer and more feasible. Pan, uh, several European countries looked into cooperative agreements to invest invest in, in water management and infrastructure and technologies in Iran. Then there's also a source of cooperation uh, between uh, Iran and, uh, and the United States. That uh, The southwestern United States uh, suffers from many of the same water challenges uh, as Iran, the management of groundwater and dry land agriculture in the arid region. Uh, so there were exchanges between uh, U.S. and Iranian uh, scientists and practitioners over strategies to save uh, Lake Urmia, that, that lake in northwestern Iran that I mentioned that was so rapidly receding, uh, and that cooperation was based on uh, shared management practices, discussion of U.S. experience with the, the Salton Sea in California. And uh, Iran has also at times pursued cooperative agreements uh, with its neighbors to manage uh, water distribution or land degradation, land degradation and desertification, for example, leading to massive dust storms around the region. Um, and that's, that's actually one of the areas that connects uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia even though the two don't share a water resource, that much of the, the dust and sand in sandstorms striking Iran actually originates in Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia's land and water policies can affect Iran and vice versa. So there are cooperative possibilities there as well as potential conflict risks. That's great. Well, I just want to ask if you have any final thoughts for listeners. This is one of the regions of the world that is most reported in the news for issues discussed in this recording, but also for so many other peripheral issues that come up regularly. So what, what would you want listeners to take away from this conversation? What are final thoughts you would like to leave? So one final note is just the resilience and hope that you often find in the Middle East that are not apparent, and that especially in, the, in our news sources here in the United States, these are not headlines you usually see. But again, when you talk to people there um, and you see they have these massive youth populations that are coming up, they're starting to move into key government positions. Uh, and it's really energizing. These are people who know the challenges of the regions and are really, really committed to solving them. So that gives me some hope not to minimize the very serious concerns that we have for this region, especially on the nuclear side and seeing how these programs um, go forward in the future. Uh, on the nuclear side specifically, just another emphasizing again that the importance of the United States leading and getting back to supporting a stronger, stronger system of global governance and strengthening the, the international order that tried to keep some of the worst threats at bay for a long time. But we also need to do so with humility. So we're not in a great place with regard to our nuclear policies to lead the world on these things. We've pulled out of a bunch of treaties. We need a smarter nuclear weapons modernization program that doesn't come across to other countries as excessive. Um, we need to show that we're committed to all of our treaty commitments uh, under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, as well as the climate commitments that we signed up to in the past. All these things will be really important for U.S. regaining a position of leadership uh, in the world to hopefully help guide regions like this, but across the world as well, uh, in, into a, a better and more stable future. Thank you, Christine. David, any final thoughts? I would suggest, again, simply the cooperative opportunities and, and possibilities for water management and other challenges in the region as well. The risks, the threats are certainly quite uh, complex, but because the roots of the most serious challenges lie in policy decisions and management, the greater possibilities there are to address those challenges through policy decisions uh, and, and smart and effective management. Certainly, environmental pressures like climate change are playing a, a growing role, uh, but smart and effective sustainable management choices can make a real difference and offer real possibilities for cooperation not only between countries, but also communities and different sectors in the water sphere. And these can be mutually beneficial, and there's increasing recognition among policymakers and publics in the region that, that this is the case, that there's more to be gained from cooperation and effective management than competition and conflict. And hopefully that will lead us to a more sustainable water future. 
Well, thank you for those parting thoughts. I think the optimism is sound and we look forward to how this region develops and how the relationship goes, especially as it relates to climate and nuclear security. Thank you to you both for the work that you do. From the Council on Strategic Risk, we greatly appreciate your time today and your participation in our working group on climate, nuclear and security affairs meant to help bring these communities together as David so eloquently put. Thank you to you both. Thanks so much. Thanks.